Good evening. Jim Wayne Miller is a teacher, a writer, and a poet. He was born in Leicester, North Carolina, in Buncombe County in Appalachia, uh, and at the age of 17, entered Berea College in Kentucky, from which he was graduated with an A.B. degree in English. Uh, before he graduated from Berea, he spent some time in Germany as a student in the Experiment in International Living. Uh, at Vanderbilt University, he received a Ph.D. in German and American Literature. For the past 14 years, he has been at Western Kentucky University, where we are filming this interview. Uh, he holds the rank of professor at Western, and his wife, uh, Mary Ellen, a native of Kentucky and the mother of their three children, is also a faculty member and a teacher of English at Western University. Jim Wayne Miller is a prodigious worker, and uh, he has published, uh, he's been, his poems have been reprinted in six books. He has four published books of his own to his credit. Uh, he's written 20 short stories and some 200 poems, and he's been published in numerous uh, uh, journals, uh, academic journals and small magazines. His books of poetry are Copperhead Cane, The More Things Change, The More They Stay the Same, Dialogue with a Dead Man, and The Figure of Fulfillment. Last year, his peers or colleagues at Western Kentucky University honored him with the Western Award for Research and Creativity. He also is sort of a Renaissance man. He has another interest, which is Appalachian Studies, and he is a consultant in Appalachian Studies at Berea and at other schools in Kentucky, Ohio, and Tennessee. Jim Wayne. Before we talk about poetry, how about reading one of your poems? I'll read you something, Al. It's called Meeting, and it is from Dialogue with a Dead Man, and it's based upon a superstition or a belief. When I was young, I used to uh, have to hoe sweet potatoes or potatoes with my grandfather. And the way we did that was to stand opposite each other in the row and pull the dirt in opposite directions. Sometimes when this occurred, the hose would hook across each other and make a clattering sound. My grandfather always said that was a sign that we would be doing that same thing another year. <clears throat> this was not a, um, um, anything that I looked forward to. But I wrote this poem after that man had died. And I pictured myself being out there in that field with alone, just me and my shadow. Meeting. My shadow was my partner in the role. He was working the slick-handled shadow of his hoe when out of the patch toward noon. There came the sound of steel on steel, two inches underground, as if our hoes had hooked each other on that spot. My shadow's hole must be of steel, I thought, and where my chopping hole came down and struck, memory rushed like water out of rock. When two strike holes, I said, it's always sign they'll work that patch together again sometime. An old man told me that the last time ever we worked this patch and our holes rang together. Delving there with my hole, I half uncovered a plow point, worn and rusted over. Ah, the man I hold with last lies under earth, I said, his plow point and his saying of equal worth. My shadow, standing by me in the row, waited, and while I rested, raised his hole. That's fine. Jim Wayne, uh, your poetry seems to run heavily to earthy images <coughs> such as plow points, uh, harvesting burley, uh, gazing at fields, following trails. Uh, do you see yourself in a line of writers with the Vanderbilt agrarian poets, fugitive agrarian poets? You studied there under one of the greatest of them, uh, Donald Davidson. Uh, you, you, you've never moved very far from where you began, have you, in terms of your origins and your growing up? 
No, I don't think it's necessary mm. to, uh, as an artist, and I think there are dangers in trying to. Um, if there's one thing that a literary work um, uh, teaches us, it's that it's possible to, possible to be very local and to be very universal at the same time. And while I, I'm not in agreement with all of the ideas expressed by the um, agrarian philosophy, I think um, in matters of art and culture, these people were exactly right. And uh, in some ways, they were um, prophetic in talking about um, uh, what uh, industrialism uh, does to our ordinary lives. Jim Wayne, do you have trouble convincing students here at Western University or wherever you teach, or even yourself, that there are mysteries left in this world uh, for which poetry is relevant and science perhaps is not? No, I don't believe I have any difficulty. Uh, I may be living in a sheltered situation in this respect. The uh, students with whom I do come in contact are uh, are there voluntarily. They already, it, maybe it's like preaching to the saved. Uh, but no, uh, I, th I think there's um, probably a, a better audience for poetry in some ways now than there was 25 or 30 years ago, especially among males. Uh, it's no longer considered necessarily an effeminate thing uh, to like poetry or to write poetry. Uh, whereas I can remember a time when I was in high school, this was taboo. I am impressed by your productivity. It reminds me somewhat of Robert Penn Warren, another Kentuckian who was a, uh, a poet, a teacher, a novelist, an essayist. Uh, how, do you, how do you manage to do as much as you do? Well, I'm sure that that's the only way that uh, Robert Penn Warren and I could be compared, that is, in trying to um, uh, to uh, be active in a number of different fields. This used to be the ideal, that is to be the complete literary man, to uh, command prose, verse, to be able to write biographies, criticism, and I think in that respect Warren is a good model for us. Most people, specialization has um, has taken over in the, in the world of, uh, of literature as much as it has in other aspects. Well, Jim Wayne, you world. haven't been embarrassed to be political either, have you? No, not at all. Uh, you, you see, we, Don't unless, you have, on that, unless you? you have a historical perspective, you, you might, uh, growing up in the, um, uh, in, in the um, oh, from the 1920s on, you might get the notion that to be an artist, you have to be either aloof uh, above all of those everyday concerns of citizenship, or you have to be um, half mad and spaced out, as the uh, mm -hmm. term might be. But this, this is an attitude that that's you, you don't find um, if you go a little further back beyond, say, the Romantic period in, um, in Europe and America. That is, um, there was no contradiction between being an artist and uh, being concerned with uh, politics, with education, with religion. And of course, Byron died fighting for Greek uh, liberation, didn't That's he? That's true. And That's true. Uh, on a <laughs> mundane scale, weren't you chairman of uh, the Warren County Citizens for uh, Jimmy Carter, or did I? Uh, no, I was I not chairman. Uh, I, I have uh, been. I've served a full term on the Warren County Democratic Executive Committee. I've worked in campaigns for local representative, uh, Dr. Kofoglis, and um, on behalf of other um, uh, national and state level uh, candidates. Tell me about Appalachia and your feeling for it. It seems to haunt your poetry. Everything you do goes back to it. What do, what do the people of Appalachia and the place, what do they mean to you? Well, I write about it because the, the Appalachian South is the only place that, for me as a poet, is a lie. It's the only place that I know by instinct. And I think it would be a mistake not to use those materials. 
Um, it's foolish for a poet to try to go out and research a subject. You write about that which is closest to you. Uh, Appalachia is, is freighted and burdened down with all kinds of, um, of myths and stereotypes. Most of the stereotypes in recent years have been the creation of uh, mass media and of sociologists. Appalachia has not been a, so much a place as it's been a problem, an economic and a social problem. And of course, everyone associates Appalachia with poverty, backwardness, ignorance, deprivation of all sorts. But there is, there is another Appalachia that always has been. You see, there only that part of Appalachia is fraught with problems that has been unfortunate enough to have vast reserves of coal and other minerals under the land. If you get on down into Blue Ridge and into other places where you have not had this destructive mining and exploitation, you do not have the same social problems. Um, Appalachian people are um, some of our earliest settlers in this part of the country. And there's not another group of people, Cratus Williams likes to make this obser uh, observation, there's not another group of people in the country who have, uh, who can trace their roots right on back to the revolutionary period in America. Nor is there another group of people whose state of mind today is, is any closer to that revolutionary point of view and that mindset and mentality. Uh, there, um, there are many values and virtues of the Appalachian people, people who cope successfully with life, that uh, the rest of the country would do well to look into. And I think the, um, the tremendous response, nationwide response to something like the Foxfire books mm -hmm. indicates to us that people are looking into it and do find something of, of value there. It's not all just past. It's, it's rather that people are reaching back into that past and, and um, preserving some of it in the present, and they'll take it with them into the future. Read me <coughs> some more of your poems. Most of these poems tend to be about people, you know. Let me read you another poem about this man, this dialogue with a dead man. And in it, the, man, the dead man speaks. You see, after his shadow moved in that first one, he's alive to me. I realize that he's a part of me. He's as much a part of me as my shadow is. And uh, in this poem, um, the dead man and I try to figure out just what is our relationship to one another. And the dead man tells me. He says, a man whose hand was cut off years before told me once he could feel that hand still moving and working like a ghost beyond the stump and claimed it remembered still how a smooth ax handle felt and what it was like to crumble warm earth between the fingers or drifting in a boat to let the fingers trail through water. And sometimes before he thought that stump would reach out for a hammer or some such tool, the gone hand grasping for it. All of my life I labored with my hands. And when death like a whirling blade cut me off, my life became a ghost hand haunting you, a body that living on remembers it. Not all your poems are that somber. Oh no, oh no. But they <laughs> often deal with death. Uh, what about your uncle's death? <laughs> all funerals are something. People, they're also, sometimes very funny things happen at funerals. They're um, sad in a way and funny in a way. Only one critic that I know of has commented about the humor in these poems that generally deal with death, and that's Wilma Dykeman mm -hmm. um, over in Newport. But even in the title here, My Uncle's Death Alters the Course of World History. There's not many uncles whose death could do that. And listen to this, here is a woman who's just become a widow. I'm watching Aunt Eunice and remembering the Cuban Missile Crisis when Sarah, near hysteria, called all the way from London and found her mother vague about it all. I let your father take care of things like that. That's what she had said. What will she do now? 
if we have a recession, or if the basement floods, or the Russians act up again, or the Democrats. Martin always took care of things like that. She sits cleaning her glasses with a tissue, seeing no one. We are all murmurs and bobbing blurs of great world issues. So you mix the, the mundane with, with the, the more important things and uh, the sudden little jerks and falls, I think that's where the humor results. Jim Wayne, um, who was the most influential person in your life when you were growing up? The man about whom these poems are, are written, uh, no doubt about him. Your father or your grandfather? This was a grandfather. It's too bad people don't have uh, grandfathers at their disposal uh, nowadays as much as I had. I, I grew up between two worlds, and they were about a half a mile apart. I grew up in the 20th century, and then uh, about a half mile out uh, across the fields, I could step back socially, culturally, economically into the 18th century at least. And all of my young life, I shuttled back and forth between those two, those two situations. Was your grandfather in the 18th century? He was in the 18th century, undoubtedly. Read another poem. I think we've got time for one more. Well, I'll, I'll read about those two worlds and how, one, how they're combined in my own life. And I think it's kind of a symbol of how uh, people, other people can, um, can bring the past into the present. It's called The Bee Woman. It'd be about this man's wife, my grandmother. She carried the eggs in her straw hat and never reached into a nest with her bare hand. A woman who could conjure warts, who knew charms for drawing fire and spells to make butter come, and the mysteries of bees and hummingbirds besides, she knew that you roll eggs from a guinea's nest with a gooseneck hoe. There's a mountain cove and light is leaving. Speckled guineas fly to roost in trees. Their potterick and screech drift far away and become the faintest peeping in my dream of stifling afternoons when we would stand, that old woman and I, by fence rows and cow trails listening for half-wild guineas, screeching as they came off nests they'd stolen away in thickets, briars, scrub pines, and chinkapins. And no matter where I wake, horns beep, ships bells, clatter of garbage cans, strange tongues spoken on the street below, in a rising, falling bunk out at sea, everywhere I stand on native ground that bee woman may pass through my dream, running under a cloud of swarming bees. She beats an empty pie pan with a spoon till the swarm settles, black on a drooping pine bough, and the guineas regroup, potterricking, all moving toward waking's waterfall. So it's always there. It's always there. Thank you, Jim Wayne Miller. Good evening.